So I think we can start. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Instruct Eric webinar series, Structure Meets Function. My name is Maria Garcia Alay, and I am a team leader at EMBL Hamburg. As you may know, uh, EMBL Hamburg is an Instruct center, and we are located at DESI in the synchrotron, and we operate three beam lines two for macromolecular crystallography and one for SACS. And we also have a large platform for sample preparation and characterization. So my role today is to chair this uh, webinar. And we have three special guests that are actually Instruct users that have been visiting different centers. So it's all three very successful stories and uh, happy that they are here sharing the results with us so that you can also learn what you can do in, in different instruct centers. So our first talk will be by Daphne George and Marilene van de Ven from ULB in Robotain in Belgium. So thanks a lot. And the floor is yours, Daphne. So hello, good morning. Uh, so my name is uh, Marilene, and I'm the, the manager of the Robotain facility. And uh, we are actually located in Liège uh, at the University of Liège uh, in Belgium. And uh, so basically today, uh, Daphne will uh, present you a, a study that was devoted to uh, the analysis of the quality of the immune response uh, following uh, mRNA vaccination in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. And she developed this essay uh, using uh, the robotic equipment and expertise. Um, and so very quickly, I will introduce uh, the platform just so that you know uh, what equipment we have and uh, what we can do with this equipment. So uh, we are actually a high throughput and robotic platform that is dedicated to uh, protein characterization. So we have a uh, liquid handling uh, robot, we have a uh, colony picking, uh, high throughput colony picking uh, robot, we have a microplate reader for every measurement of uh, fluorescence um, or absorbance in a high throughput manner in, in microplate uh, format. We also have a um, capillary electrophoresis machine for high throughput uh, SDS page essay. And we have also a BLI, so which measures uh, in real time binding kinetics. And Daphne uh, will uh, explain you exactly what we can do with that. And very soon we will have um, the possibility uh, to do high throughput uh, DSFSA and high throughput uh, DLS uh, machine in a microplate uh, format as well. And so basically we do uh, high throughput protein purification with our system. We can also uh, do high throughput protein expression uh, by optimizing uh, media composition and so on. We do high throughput protein formulation experiment as well. Uh, we can set up any high throughput enzymatic assay. We also do high throughput binding assay, and this uh, will be developed by Daphne. And finally, we also do high throughput protein stability measurement. But now I leave. Um, Daphne, explain you exactly what she developed. So hello everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share my work with you today. So I will present to you the development of a high throughput essay using the robotin facilities for high DG avidity determination in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, first of all, to evaluate the humoral immune response following infection, it is common to measure the concentration of antibodies present in the blood. High level of antibodies is generally associated to a strong humoral immune response, and it is the same principle in the context of vaccination, and antibody titers are used to evaluate the vaccine efficiency. However, antibody uh, titers don't reflect the qualitative part of the immune response, and this parameter alone is not sufficient to conclude to a good immune response. It is why we also focus on the antibody avidity, which can give more information about the quality of the response. So the antibody avidity, and more precisely the IgG avidity, corresponds to all the strengths between a multivalent antigen and polyclonal antibodies. This parameter is often used to date an infection. For example, it is important for pregnant women in the context of CMV infection. 
And moreover, as I said just before, this power meter is important to evaluate the quality of the immune response induced by infection or vaccination. Indeed, here is a brief explanation of the humoral immune response. When our body encounters an antigen following infection or vaccination, this antigen is captured by a dendritic cells. This cell presents um, the antigen to helper T lymphocyte, and then the helper T lymphocyte can activate naive B cells. This activation leads to the proliferation of B cells and into the differentiation in short-lived plasma cells, which are the cells uh, which secret antibodies. These antibodies are then found in the blood about five days after the antigen encounter and have low affinity for the antigen. In parallel to this process, some activated B cell migrate to a structure named the germinal center. In this structure, B cells also proliferate but undergo somatic hypermutations in the genes coding the variable domain in order to improve the affinity for the specific antigen. After that, there is a selection for the high affinity immunoglobulin, and in the case where the mutation decreased the affinity, these cells died by apoptosis. In the other case, where the affinity is improved, these cells can differentiate into memory B cells or into long-lived plasma cells, which secret high level of antibodies with high affinity for the antigen. Thus, IgG, assessment, IgG avidity assessment was done in several studies in order to understand the immune, the immune response following a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And in the study presented here, they measured the avidity using ELISA assay. They used polyclonal antibodies from infected subjects, and they used urea as chaotropic reagent to determine the avidity of antibodies. By this way, they can determine an avidity index, which corresponds to the ratio of the level of anti-RBD IDG measured with or without urea. However, ELISA essay has uh, two important disadvantages. First, it is the use of chaotropic reagent to measure the avidity. And second, the value of the avidity corresponds to the endpoint of the interaction kinetic. Indeed, in the graph shown here, there are three different analytes at the same concentration, which bind the same immobilized ligand. They have the same affinity for the antigen, but uh, when we focus on the association and the dissociation phases, we observed that they are completely different. So to overcome uh, these issues, we have been inspired by a study of the group of Tamaras Realazai in uh, 2018, and we decided to use bio-layer interferometry to measure the avidity of polyclonal antibodies. Bio-layer interferometry has the main advantage to realize high throughput experiments. This technique allows to obtain real-time kinetics parameters for the interaction of two molecules. The principle is based on the white light reflected by two surfaces, an internal reference layer, and the layer which contain the immobilized molecules. In the first case represented here, it is the interference pattern of the internal uh, between the internal reference layer and the ligand bound to the sensor, which gives the blue curve. And in the second case represented here, it is the interference pattern of the internal reference layer and the molecule bonds to the ligand, which gives the orange curve. And the difference between the two curves can provide a real-time kinetic parameters of the association and the dissociation phases of the interaction. In other words, the change in thickness of the layer step reflects a change in wavelength, and in this respect, binding kinetics are measured in real time. So as I said in the beginning of the presentation, the avidity corresponds to all the binding strength, whereas the affinity corresponds to the strength of a single interaction, which means an antibody for one epitope of the antigen. So to determine the IgG avidity, the target antigen is bound to uh, the biosensor. In our case, we bond the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, which is known to be the principal target of antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2. And then the sensors are dipped into the solution containing the analytes, which are the purified IgG from serum. It allows to observe the observation of the complex front. 
Then the sensors are dipped into neutral buffer and we can observe the natural dissociation of the complex forms. So we only focus on these phases to determine the avidity because the way in which a complex dissociates represents its stability and consequently the avidity of antibodies. And because the dissociation rate, the k of is concentration independent, it can be used to determine the antibody avidity for polyclonal antibodies, for which the concentration of antigen-specific antibodies is unknown among the entire polyclonal antibodies. And in this way, a low dissociation of the complex mean, means a high stability of the interaction and consequently suggests high antibody avidity. It exists many kinds of biosensors, and we decided to use amino reactive second generation biosensors. These sensors contain carboxylic acids on their surface, which can be activated by reaction with ADCs or NHS to generate reactive NHS ester. The ester rapidly reacts with the primary amines of the ligand, and in our case, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, and that's from highly stable amide bonds. Then, after the ligand immobilization, a quench step with ethylalamine is realized in order to prevent non-specific interaction between analytes and the biosensor. And then a baseline curve is uh, realized by the immersion of the biosensors into a PBS buffer. Sensor sensors are then dipped into the solution containing polyclonal IgG to observe the association. And finally, they are dipped in the same well used for the baseline in order to observe the natural dissociation of the complex form. And the two negative uh, contours are realized. A uh, first one with the immobilized ligand and without analytes, and another one without ligand and with analytes. This control allows to ensure the absence of non specific interaction. And then uh, all samples are analyzed at three dilutions of, of total IgG. By this way, we ensure that the K of value is similar between the samples. And here is an example of data obtained. You can see an influence of, for the association phases with higher level of IgG for the lower dilution, but no influence of the uh, concentration for the dissociation phases. To analyze the data, first, a uh, local fitting of the curves is realized on each curve, and then a global fitting is performed to um, obtain the finite value of the dissociation, and it is uh, this value which is used to assess the avidity. Now, uh, I will show you some concrete results that we obtain. To study the quality of the immune response following SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination, we have the serum uh, from people of two cohorts, PICOVAC and Nephrovac. Among these cohorts, we have four groups of individuals, immunocompetent individuals represented by healthy staff members and immunocompromised individuals represented by elderly residents from nursing home, kidney transplant uh, recipients and hemodialysis people. Some of them are, were naive or pre-infected before the first vaccine dose, which means they previously contracted the disease before the vaccination. And all of them uh, received three vaccine doses, and the blood samples were collected at baseline before the first vaccine dose, three weeks after or just before the second vaccine dose, one week after the second vaccine dose, four weeks after the second vaccine dose, just before the third dose and the four weeks uh, after the third vaccine dose. And here are the results that we obtain. So in the X axis, it is uh, the timeline. And in the Y axis, it is the IgG avidity, um, which is represented using the inverse of the KO value to have high avidity uh, value on the top and low avidity value on the bottom. In blue is uh, are represented immunocompetent, that is healthy staff members, and in orange are uh, immunocompromised individuals with a different symbol for each subgroups. On the left, there is are uh, the naive and on the right, the pre-infected people. So first, concerning naive people, we observe uh, no data for the baseline. It is normal because they were naive, so they haven't any IgG at that time, so no avidity can be measured. Then, 
we observe a high avidity maturation for immunocompetent in blue, and this maturation is slower for immunocompromised. The avidity decreased before the third dose and then highly increased after the third vaccine dose. And concerning the pre-infected um, individuals, at baseline, most subjects already have high have high DG with avidity similar to one dose of vaccine for immunocompromised, but for immunocompetent, infection leads to a lower avidity compared to vaccination. However, after one vaccine dose, all subjects have an important maturation of avidity with a kind of plateau reached. Then, as for naive, avidity decreased before the third dose, but less than for naive subject. And after the third dose, avidity intensively uh, increased in all groups. So this data suggests that immunocompromised people as immunocompetence are capable to develop a strong immune response despite their immunodeficiency. However, a BS is present in this study and concern uh, pre-infected immunocompromised Indeed, the blood samples were collected on survival, so meaning they were able to develop a strong immune response following infection. And it is why at baseline, immunocompromised had a higher avidity compared to immunocompetent. The last interesting point uh, concerned the decrease in avidity uh, over time, why we would tend to believe that the avidity increase over time or at least uh, would be maintained. Our hypothesis for the moment suggests that mRNA vaccination doesn't allow to maintain a GC reaction over time, but it is at this stage only an hypothesis, and I will soon verify this theory by a study, the avidity with another type of vaccine, and also compared with a cohort of infected people with blood samples collected during uh, six months before the vaccination campaign. So to finish this presentation, I would like to show you four published studies that we participated. The first one concerned the immune response after two vaccine doses in elderly uh, residents from nursing home compared to healthy staff members. The results show a poor response in, elder, in elderly compared to the staff. The second study concerned the antibody response in children. The basis of the less severe clinical presentation of COVID-19 in children as compared with adults remains uh, incompletely understood. And other su studies suggested that a more potent boosting of immunity to endemic common cold coronaviruses may protect children. And the results of this study suggest that young children are able to develop an effective antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 independently to their immunity to common coronaviruses. The third study is the next part of the first one and concerns the evolution of the immune response after the third vaccine dose. They conclude that the third dose is really required to elder light and allow to reach similar response to healthy staff member. And the last one concerns the immune response following mRNA vaccination in kidney transplant recipient. As you may know, these people are at high risk of death and respond poorly to the vaccination. In this study, uh, they try to identify parameters uh, which are capable to predict a breakthrough infection despite the vaccination. And among the parameters that they identified as potential risk factors for SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infection, there is the IgG avidity for the RBD. So uh, to conclude this presentation, the avidity determination is an important parameter to take into account in the study of the human wild immune response. And in long term, it, it could help to adapt vaccination strategy uh, for vulnerable people. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Daphne, for sharing these results with us. So now we are open for questions, and you can leave your question at the Q&A section on your chat, and I will be reading them. So I don't see any questions at the moment for Daphne, but I, I am going to ask. So so you, you were showing the, the results for IgG. Have you, have you checked on other types of IgG? No, only IgG. No. Okay. At, uh, because, uh, because we have uh, blood samples, and in blood samples, we have uh, principally IgG uh, in the oh. cell. 
Do you expect also differences, uh, the same type of, of response for IgM, for example? What would you? Uh, yes, for IgM, we it's probably that we have uh, other types of response because uh, they are non-specific, so they are uh, less, uh, yes, they are non-specific for the antigen, so the avidity, the, um, they doesn't have any uh, uh, somatic permutation in their genes. Okay, so from a technical point, uh, maybe also for that could be useful for other, other uh, users that want to come to, to the robotin facility or any other instruct center that has a VLI. Uh, what do you think it's, it's the real advantage of doing this type of uh, experiments with a VLI if you would compare it with an SPR, for example? I can give you my, my opinion also later. We also have a, sorry about that. Uh, first, the main advantage is the uh, ability to uh, do high throughput experiments and uh, it is not the case with SPR. Uh, for the advantage, I, I know the SPR is uh, less sensitive for the um, uh, for the affinity parameters, but us we only focus on the uh, dissociation phases. So uh, the BLIR interferometry is uh, correspond. Uh, perfectly for the this kind of experiments. I don't know if there are, was a question. Ah. A naive question. Uh, concerning the question for the avidity of a monoclonal antibody. Uh, if it's a monoclonal antibody, uh, we can measure the affinity. Here we measure the avidity because we have uh, all of the antibodies directed uh, against the antigen. So um, but I, I measure the uh, difference between polyclonal antibodies versus AFIB2 of uh, these polyclonal antibodies. And uh, we observe uh, really um, close um, avidity for the AFIB2 uh, and uh, the total IgG. So sorry about that. There was a telephone couldn't stop ringing. No problem. So so here's another question. What quality criteria for serum do you need to isolate IgG from the samples and the quantity? Uh, can I have, um, can you precise uh, what you mean by uh, uh, quality criteria for the serum? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can because some, someone was posting this on, on the, on the Q&A, I would assume it means probably how much serum do you need and the time when it was taken, so how long are you storing it and, and so on. Probably this person would need some explanation regarding the sample preparation, how, yes. how complicated it is. So uh, from the uh, serum of individuals, we purified uh, total IgG using melon gel. I don't know if you know, is a uh, is, uh, kind of um, affinity purification uh, as uh, like a protein A or protein J, but uh, uh, it's not the same protein, but we have uh, height, um, height, uh, I healed of um, of uh, purification with uh, more than uh, ninety percent of uh, IgG uh, purified, and for the quantity, um, it depends of the. In fact, uh, we test a different quantity of um, of total IgG because it depends of the response of the uh, individuals. For example, uh, for uh, the pro responder uh, as uh, transplanted, we need uh, more um, total IgG because they have less uh, IgG directed against the antigen. 
So um, we test different uh, dilution of total IgG, and uh, in our case, uh, the dilution that uh, I present, so the dilution three, five, and eight, is enough for the um, the um, the measurement. But I think it's something that uh, you have to test uh, according the the people um, they need. Deb. So, so here and a quick question here. It says, are these techniques usable for other microbes? Which yes, uh, I I had um, done some um, avidity measurement in the context of the toxin pertussis. So another kind of antigen, and uh, we fix also the antigen on the sensors, and uh, we have also polyclonal IgG of, uh, from different cohorts, and uh, it's uh, we have good results. Uh, so here, Don Jui Wu is asking, uh, why are you monitoring K off and not K on? Because uh, the kaon is uh, dependent of the concentration of uh, the analytes, whereas the curve is not. Uh, the curve is only dependent of the complex form. And uh, then, uh, because it is independent of the uh, concentration of ligand and uh, the concentration of analytes, we can use these parameters alone to um, deduce the avidity. And the last one here, uh, it says uh, from Shruti Uni, thank you for the nice talk. And how exactly would you uh, would avidity determination help in immunosuppressed individuals? Uh, to be more precise, uh, the avidity determination is a part of my thesis, and I do also uh, epitope mapping. And the combination of these uh, both parameters uh, concerning the quality of the immune response could help uh, to help the immunosuppressed uh, individuals because uh, we can, um, uh, with these results, we can observe that uh, maybe the response is different uh, in the germinal center reaction. If the avidity is different, maybe uh, it could be an explanation and. Uh, we can adapt with a different uh, kind of vaccination and the different doses, for example. Okay, so there's just one more and maybe we can have a short answer if possible. And then we move to the next talk. Is see, it's, uh, can we apply these screening procedures to biofilm samples? <laughs> So, so in, in our experience, I, if, if it depends on the biofilm, right? Uh, how how you can solubilize this, because you have to you have to um, add it to a like a kind of an ELISA plate. You have to pipe it that. So Daphne, what what uh, Daphne? According to my experience, uh, no, I don't know, but uh, we can uh, look after that uh, after the presentation. And uh, we can uh, send you an email and uh, we can discuss about that uh, and uh, with Marilyn uh, if you are interested. Yeah, we have another sort of experiment. I have no idea how we could we could do that, but. Yes, yeah. yes, of course. Okay, we can discuss it later on. Great. So thanks a lot, Daphne and Marilyn. You're welcome. And now we will go to the next talk. So our next guest is Maria Di Marogona from University of Patras in Greece. So Maria, are you able to Hello. share the, yes. the presentation? Um, Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, it's starting to be shared. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, it works. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Maria Di Marogna. Uh, I'm assistant professor uh, at the 
Department of Chemical Engineering of the University of Patras in Greece. <clears throat> and the title of my talk for today is uh, Structural Insights into Carbohydrate Active Enzymes for the Design of pra Plastic De uh, Degrading Biocatalysts. <clears throat> So, uh, as the title implies, we're going to talk about uh, carbohydrate and especially uh, lignocellulose degrading enzymes. So, in the interest uh, in this uh, group of enzymes goes back to the middle of the last century, where we want to exploit uh, lignocellulose as a renewable carbon source and as an answer to the depletion of fossil fuels and the, the need for renewable energy. Uh, so these enzymes uh, break down biomass, and why want to break down biomass? Mostly to take the sugars, ferment them, and produce um, uh, fuels or other uh, valuable chemicals, or directly uh, use the hydrolysis, the degradation products. So uh, biomass uh, is mainly composed uh, by three uh, three. Uh, um, components. So first we have cellulose, uh, which is a homopolymer of uh, glucose units. Uh, each chain of uh, cellulose connects with another by hydrogen bonds, creating a quite recalcitrant structure to degrade. And then uh, surrounding cellulose, we have hemicellulose and lignin. Uh, hemicellulose is a heterogeneous uh, a uh, mix of polymers, uh, with the main representative being xylem, uh, which is a, a polymer of uh, mainly xylose units that bear various decorations. Last, uh, but not, not least, is lignin, uh, that was uh, quite, until quite recently uh, considered a useless um, component, but now uh, we are trying to exploit it, it, uh, it is also heterogeneous and it's mainly composed of uh, monolignols uh, that are uh, connected by ether and ester bonds. So uh, since uh, my PhD, I have been working on these enzymes, mainly uh, on their structural study. Uh, our group has worked on uh, cellulose degrading enzymes, uh, hemicellulose and also lignin degrading enzymes. Uh, but today we are going to focus on a group of enzymes that uh, cleave uh, hemicellulose, but also uh, the links between hemicellulose and lignin. So uh, I'm going to talk about ferulic acid esterases uh, that um, act uh, on uh, the hemicellulose part of lignocellulose. Here is an arabinoxylan uh, chain, uh, which is mainly composed of xylose units that bear various substitutions, uh, such arabinose, uh, which is ester linked to ferulic acid. So ferruloyl esterase cleave uh, this bond, the, the ester bond between uh, the hydroxy group of arabinose at position five or two and ferulic acid. So why are we interested in ferulic acid esterases? Uh, firstly, uh, by cleaving this bond, uh, we make biomass more easily degraded by uh, other enzymes. So the, the initial idea to get the biomass uh, decomposed to its monomers uh, will be facilitated by the use uh, of uh, such enzymes. Uh, in addition to that, ferulic acid as a product of uh, the action of this enzyme can be uh, directly used as a product, as a component in uh, cosmetics uh, due to its antioxidant protein uh, properties. So it is used in skincare and sunscreen products, but also uh, as a flavoring agent uh, 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 because it is, can, can be converted to vanillin, which is uh, used in the food industry. So um, uh, here I will present um, our results on a ferulic acid esterase from Fusarium oxysporum, which is a filamentous fungus that degrades biomass. And uh, it, we are, I'm going to call it FO5C from now on. Uh, so it's a quite long story that starts from my PhD and the ends uh, today. It doesn't end, excuse me, it, it still continues. 
Um, to make a long story short, uh, our work started back in 2008 uh, with the cloning and biochemical characterization of the enzyme. Uh, these experiments were done at the Technical University of Athens in the group led by Professor Christakopoulos, now by Associate Professor Topakas. And as a PhD student, I was asked to determine the structure of this enzyme. And as you can see, for various reasons, we managed to publish it in 2020. I will explain later why this delay was um, done. And uh, quite recently, we published the structure of the enzyme in complex with uh, its reaction product. So uh, let's go back in, in the history. Uh, as I told you in 2008, um, we, we cloned and expressed the FOFIC in Pichia pastoris. This is a host that we commonly use in the lab because we work on fungal enzymes that are glycosylated and Pichia pastoris <laughs> correctly processes these enzymes. And um, uh, the main way to characterize these enzymes is to test them on a, a esters, methyl esters of hydroxychinamic acids found in plant biomass. So uh, the initial biochemical characterization showed that this enzyme was active on uh, uh, methyl coumarate, caffeate, and ferulate, these three um, hydroxychinamate esters, but not that much on methyl synapate. Uh, so uh, as a PhD student, I was asked, as I told you, to determine the structure uh, since uh, there was no structure of a uh, close homologue. So we could not uh, explain uh, structurally these uh, results. Um, so we, we managed back then to grow crystals of this enzyme. Uh, these uh, these um, experiments were done at the, the National Hellenic Research uh, Foundation. Uh, as you can see, we had quite nice crystals. And a uh, first data set was collected in 2012 uh, at EMBL Hamburg in the frame of a EMB EMBL CCP4 training course. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the crystal diffracted quite decently to 2.3 angstrom resolution. And uh, the, over the overall data collection statistics were, were quite good. But uh, we were in a pre alpha fold era. Uh, this is uh, mainly for the new crystallographers. Uh, at that time, um, uh, if uh, molecular replacement did not work, uh, we had to use experimental phasing techniques. As I told you, there was no uh, structural homologue, uh, uh, no homologue with known structure determined at that time. So uh, at that time, to, to make molecular replacement work, uh, you, need, you needed a homologue of at, at least 30% identity. So there was not such one, so we could not use uh, this data to solve the structure by molecular replacement. So we made various uh, attempts uh, to, to solve the structure by experimental phasing techniques, uh, either by anomalous diffraction experiments or um, isomorphous replacement. But uh, unlikely, we could not uh, we could not insert a heavy atom in our uh, crystals, and we also tried sulfur set, which was a technique. It, it is a technique that exploits uh, the anomalous diffraction by sulfur atoms, but this did neither work. So uh, we were left with our data until uh, two years later, a Japanese group. Uh, managed uh, to solve uh, the structure of a homologue uh, using I an iodinated derivative. Uh, so uh, this was the first structure of, of the Tanas Lake ferroloyl esterase. This is a, the specific family where these enzymes belong to. So this group uh, showed that um, these enzymes are two domain enzymes. In green, it's the catalytic domain. Uh, in purple, uh, the so-called lead domain, and they also found that there was an ion, uh, which they, 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 um, they, they, they identified it as calcium, that is supposed to, uh, in a way, stabilize the lead domain. So uh, similarly to all uh, serine hydrolases, uh, they ident identified a, a ser, a histidine aspartate catalytic triad, and what was unprecedented it was a, a disulfided bond that uh, brought together the serine and the histidine of the catalytic triad. Uh, 
So uh, as you understand, we, we used their model to also um, solve the structure of FOFISC. And uh, the relative publication came out uh, quite later. I will explain you why. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it, is, it was also a dimer in the crystal. Uh, it is a quite heavily glycosylated enzyme. Uh, similarly to the Japanese group, it is a two domain enzyme and uh, it has a, a catalytic triad and uh, the calcium ion. Uh, the identity of which was further proved by ICP-MS. So, um, as I told you, the structure was determined in 2014, but the, it, the, the, the relevant publication came out in 2020. But in the meanwhile, uh, in 2017, a Japanese group again uh, came out with a publication in science uh, where they reported um, a bacterium that could uh, degrade a semi-crystalline PET. So why am I, I'm, am, I, am I telling you about this work? Because uh, while we were analyzing our structure, we showed that the, the third closest structural homologue of f of c is one of the enzymes identified by the Japanese group to be able to cleave PET. In specific, the Japanese group uh, appended this uh, ability of the bacterium to two main enzyme activities. The one is petase, which cleaves PET uh, into smaller fragments, and then is mehtase, which cleaves uh, mehT uh, to the final uh, components of uh, PET polymer, that is ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. Uh, I should mention that uh, research on plastic degrading enzymes has flourished the last years due to the environmental problems created by the ever-increasing accumulation of plastic uh, in the environment. So, uh, as you can see, structurally, the two enzymes, MHTase and FOFIC, are quite similar. So, they, they both have the two domain structures. To the, the calcium uh, uh, ion that links the two domains, and also the disulfide bond that was unprecedented in serine hydrolases. Uh, so uh, no, uh, naturally, what we did was to see if f of i c could also degrade uh, MHT. And uh, as you can see, these are results from the uh, from Topaka's group in NTUA, where they showed that uh, actually uh, FOFIC uh, can increase overall PET uh, uh, degradation when combine, combined with a PETase-like enzyme. And uh, here you can see that it actually acts like an MHTase, uh, releasing a terephthalic acid from uh, PET oligomers. So what was uh, the next uh, thing to look after was to, to see how f of I c can accommodate both um, uh, uh, hydroxychinamic acids derived from lignocellulose and uh, PET oligomers in, in its active site and whether we could engineer this to, to, to shift towards a one, uh, to one of the two activities. So at that time, I had moved uh, to the University of Patras and I had uh, no access to crystallization capacity. Uh, but uh, I applied uh, to INET's discovery for support and I was able to use the facility uh, of uh, EXX High Throughput Crystallography Lab at EMBL Grenoble. Uh, we could send pure protein along with the ligands, with our ligands, and have them crystallized, uh, co-crystallized, soaked, and uh, data collected. And I, I must say that they were very helpful in all the procedure, providing also advice on the, on the, um, on the way to proceed. So uh, as I told you, we tested both um, compounds derived from plant biomass and uh, from uh, PET. And uh, here is uh, the crystals and uh, the FFIC crystals that we that they grew in Grenoble. This is the interface uh, the user uh, has access to to monitor the crystallization results. Uh, you can have uh, you can have uh, pictures of the crystals uh, every um, 
specific time frames and also UV visualization to check if it's actual protein crystal. Um, and of course, you, uh, the user can interact and score uh, its uh, drop. So uh, this, they also have the, 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 the possibility to, to directly select crystals uh, for data collection without the need uh, for cryoprotection. Uh, so out of all the compounds tested, uh, we managed to get a complex structure with uh, cumaric acid. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the data uh, was not collected at Grenoble, Grenoble because at that time it was not open to, to the users, uh, but um, we collected the data uh, at uh, Hamburg, AMBL uh, uh, Hamburg, uh, Beamline P13. Uh, the space group was the same as the, the APO structure. Uh, the crystal dif dif diffracted much better than the APO enzyme, and uh, they were quite um, anisotropic. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the, the, um, the, the process uh, of the data was uh, done uh, by an in-house um, software, uh, Autocroc, that takes into account this anisotropy and exploits uh, more data than common uh, data processing uh, prog programs. Um, so here is the structure. Uh, similar to the APO enzyme, it's heavily glycosylated. Uh, the cumaric acid, the product, is sandwiched between uh, the two domains, the lead domain and the catalytic domain. And here you can see the electron density uh, for the bound ligand. Um, in detail, uh, the phenyl ring of the cumaric uh, acid is uh, buried in a hydrophobic environment that it's mainly contributed by residues derived from the lead domain in green, in green, excuse me, but also from residues in the catalytic domain in blue. And also some hydrogen bond interactions, mainly um, by residues forming the catalytic triad, but also two residues forming the oxyanion hole commonly found in a serine hydrolase. Uh, so when compared to the APO structure, uh, the main uh, structural changes observed uh, are uh, quite local, uh, meaning that there is no overall uh, structural rearrangement, uh, even though the occurrence of the lead um, made us think of lipases and um, where there is a, a, a considerable movement of the lead domain, uh, we could uh, locate the catalytic serine in two conformations uh, that are reminiscent of an active and, uh, and the resting state of the enzyme. And the main uh, structural change was observed on a tyrosine that was shifted towards the phenyl ring upon substrate binding. Uh, so uh, back in the plastic uh, degrading enzyme, MHPase, as you can see again, here, uh, the, the two enzymes are quite, uh, are, are, are very close, structurally speaking. So now we are designing point mutations based on the superposition of these uh, two structures. In specific, uh, we have uh, created mutants where we replace uh, residues that participate in ligand binding in ferrulolesterases that are not conserved in MHTs to see uh, the effect uh, of this uh, change on the overall enzyme activity. But this is ongoing research. Uh, so, um, to sum up, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators, especially uh, Professor Topakas uh, in his lab, uh, uh, the cloning and biochemical characterization of the enzymes take place, and um, Stratos Nikolaidis for the production of the enzymes, uh, Christina Ferrusi for uh, the analysis of the structure, Costadinos uh, Makarinotis and George Saxidis for the experiments on the plastic um, substrates. Christos Kosina, who is working with me in Patras for the structure determination. Uh, I should also thank uh, Vagelia Christina for the initial uh, crystallization trials of and structure determination of the APO enzyme. But I should also refer to uh, the staff scientists at EMBL Hamburg 
uh, Gleborenkov for the data collection of the initial data set and Ms. Ms. Michele Chianti Guillaume Pompidor for their contribution in the um, experimental phasing techniques that unfortunately failed. Last, uh, from the AXTX lab, as I told you, uh, the, it is headed by Jose Marquez. We had great support by, by the people there and special thanks to Guillaume Hoffman. And of course, I should thank uh, our financial uh, contributors and INEX Discovery for all this support throughout all these years. And the people working this project have been uh, paid by a program, uh, Horizon 2020 program, by RICEP, uh, um, an HFRI program, Plastomics, and uh, funding from the University of Patras. And uh, thank you all for, for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria, for the beautiful structures. And now we will open for questions. Uh, I will give some time until the, the audience start making questions. I, I have a, a question for you. So you were, you were able to solve your structure by molecular replacement after you got the structure from the Japanese group who got it with um, needed faith, it's actually. Have you done the experiment? Because at that point, there was no alpha fold 2. Have you done the experiment now trying to see if you can solve it with molecular replacement using the alpha fold 2 model? Uh, we are, uh, excuse me, uh, to solve the structure by the, uh, using the alpha fold model. Yes. No, so I get, a, get an alpha fold model and do molecular replacement on your structure. So I tell you because I, I, I did that as an exercise with all the with all the, my proteins that I needed experimental phases and it worked. Most of the times it worked. So yeah. Uh, to, to be honest, this year we solved two structures that had no structural homologue and that we would never solve without alpha fold and it worked very nice yeah yeah, yeah it works <laughs> it's a great tool that that we have now and uh, yeah we we have to use it so yeah people are, are writing so curious to know for the initial alpha fold based mr have you tried ah <laughs> i think it's <laughs> the opposite have you tried to use the two distinct domains as the search model uh, we did not use the alpha fold uh, but the Concerning the Japanese uh, model, no, we did not separate uh, the two domains. We yeah. used it as a whole. Yeah, we we were kind of thinking on the on the same line with <laughs> yeah. with this person. I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, I I might ask something. So, for using this uh, kind of um, plastic degradation, or even for the cosmetic um, industry. Do you, do you think this is feasible? One could scale up these uh, enzymes and and bring it to uh, a, the but, next level. Or uh, regarding the use in cosmetics, it's already done. I okay. mean, if you Google ferulic acid cosmetics, it is out in the market. And and, and uh, they produce it like a large scale. Excuse me. They they produce the enzyme in in large scale and commercialize it and. You know. The enzyme. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I I do not know, <laughs> yeah, but I assume that yes, I I'm not sure about this answer. So uh, regarding the degradation of plastics, it's it's still under uh, investigation. It's not, it has not been efficiently applied. Let's see. Yeah, if it works, it's <laughs> yeah, it will it would be super. Yeah, lots of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't see more questions, but I'm sure if there is something coming up, they can they can contact you later. So many thanks ag again, Maria, for, Thank you. for your seminar. And now we can go to our last speaker. So it's Leonardo Alonso. Uh, he's a user coming, uh, it's not in, in Europe at the moment, he's in South America, in Argentina. So there's a time difference of five hours and basically it's the middle of the night for him. So thanks a lot, uh, Leo, for being here. And yeah, the, the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Are you receiving okay this? Because... All good, all good, yeah. Okay, well, here is very early, dark, and uh, I am a bit shallow of the summertime there. So I will present uh, our result on the effect of... Um, teeny post-translational modification on the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. 
I work at the University of Buenos Aires Nanobiotech Institute in Argentina. So we will explore uh, the underlying mechanisms behind this neglected PTM and how it affects uh, the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we are interested on its uh, potential implication for viral pathogenesis and uh, in turn uh, would help us in the development of uh, better vaccines. Um, well, let me see if it's working. Yes, well, SARS-CoV-2 is probably the most famous virus on Earth. Uh, it has caused uh, a lot of um, death, produced a huge negative impact uh, economic, and forced us to stay at home for months. Uh, the virus uh, is a small uh, positive sense, single strand RNA virus belonging to the coronavirus family. Uh, the genus is the beta coronavirus, and the subgenus is Sarvecoviruses, where the SARS uh, uh, virus also belongs. Uh, no SARS 2, just SARS. Um, the virus encodes for more or less 20 proteins, um, including four structural proteins, the spike protein, the envelope protein, the membrane protein, and the nucleoprotein. And uh, uh, we focus on the spike protein because it's of major importance for virus infectivity and for therapeutic purpose. Uh, native spike uh, is a trimeric highly glycosylated protein, type 1 fusion protein, um, that recognize uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE2, uh, a restricted set, set of uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, and mediates the specific host, host cell recognition and the subsequent membrane fusion in order to deliver the genetic material of the virus in the infected cell. Uh, the spike protein is uh, central to the virus host uh, interaction uh, because uh, uh, determine the infectivity, uh, the host cell specificity, uh, also the receptor usage, not only the primary receptor usage like uh, ACE2, but also the secondary receptor such as uh, integrin, and uh, enable the uh, transmission from animals to human and vice versa, uh, which call spillover event. And uh, on the other hand, uh, is the uh, is the main target for uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies and also in general for neutralizing antibodies uh, is uh, the major antigen of commercial vaccines and harbor most of the mutation that are observed in Martian uh, variants. So uh, we are going to talk about some basic facts of the amidation. Well, the amidation is simply the conversion of amide group uh, to carboxylic group at the side chain of asparagine and glutamine residues, uh, and can occur through different mechanisms. And uh, for example, direct hydrolysis, or even maybe catalyzed, catalyzed by enzyme. Um, the mechanisms by which the amidation occurs uh, have a profound impact on its effect and uh, consequence. Uh, uh, it is generally regarded as a detrimental PTM with negative impact on protein stability and function. Uh, it is usually measured in uh, in, in biological production as a critical quality attribute. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, functional demidation uh, uh, examples are very scarce. Probably one of the best described is the uh, integrin binding uh, of the amidate uh, peptide. Um, uh, the amidation uh, might affect viral proteins, um, for example, might affect uh, antibody recognition. Uh, 
can mediate uh, a PTM uh, driving antigenic drift, uh, can disrupt the recognition of peptide by the T cell receptor, or <laughs> can generate the novel integrin binding sites, or simply to be irrelevant for protein function. Uh, we should say that uh, MI group in proteins are extremely stable for uh, to drive to direct hydrolysis and uh, at most uh, physiological uh, pH. So why uh, the amidation deserve to be studied beyond uh, pharmaceutical stability is the, the aim of our work. So um, let's talk about the mechanisms. So uh, non-enzymatic uh, spontaneous deamidation go through a cyclic intermediate, which is the limiting step. The formation of a five member ring for the case of a paragene residue uh, is highly favored over the formation of a six member ring in the case of glutamine and the average deamidation half time for asparagine residues as by far faster than for glutamine residues. And uh, on war, we are only talk about the deamidation of aparagine residues. Uh, the mechanisms is uh, include the intramolecular uh, reaction, uh, the imi nitrogen atom of the asparagine plus one amino acid uh, make a direct uh, nucleophilic attack uh, on the uh, carbonyl group of the asparagine lateral uh, change. Um, leading to the formation of a cyclic succinimide that can be hydrolyzed uh, to form aspartic acid or isospartic acid. Um, the bulkiness of the asparagine plus one amino acid, uh, the lateral flow of the, the lateral side chain of the uh, amino acid, uh, heavily impact the deamidation uh, half time. And a uh, direct consequence of this is that the dipeptide asparagine and glycine uh, is by far the fastest deamidation site. Uh, also, secondary and tertiary structure affect the amidation half time and the increase uh, on the pH and increasing temperature also uh, accelerate uh, the amidation uh, rate. Uh, what the consequence uh, of the amidation? Because the amidation can be regarded as a mechanism that emulate a time delayed mutational event. Uh, first of all, the amidation introduces a negative charge instead of the neutral asparagine uh, by the introduction of a particle or isospartic acid. But more important, the amidation uh, introduces a beta amino acid. Uh, that is the isospartic uh, residue. A very important thing is uh, the amidation can be uh, directly emulated by mutation because uh, it is impossible to introduce the isospartic residue. Um, um, let me see. So, um, Uh, the identification of uh, uh, the amidation prone asparagine in a uh, large protein containing thousands or even uh, hundreds of asparagine residues uh, poses significant methodological uh, challenges. Uh, we first use a bioinformatic approach to uh, recognize those residues that are more likely to deamidate. There are many ways to do that, but our approach was very simple and by, based on uh, pre-existing uh, experimental data. Uh, in a detailed and significant uh, work uh, done by Robinson et al, uh, who, com who calculate uh, the deamidation half time for the entire combination of uh, uh, asparagine peptides. Uh, in the context of pentapeptide, uh, 
we can see that that the deamidation half time uh, is heavily uh, impacted by the identity of the asparagine plus one amino acid. And uh, uh, for example, the deamidation half time can be uh, as fast as, as uh, one day or uh, can be uh, like uh, an year. Um, but the important is that the identity of the of the asparagine plus one amino acid define the the amidation uh, half time mainly. Um, uh, but uh, using these experimental values, uh, we calculate the amidation half time in the context of structured uh, proteins. Uh, we introduce uh, two terms: the H and D term uh, that include uh, the effect of protein structure on the on the on the overall uh, the amidation half time. Uh, the H value is calculated from sheep red uh, and indicate the propensity uh, of a sequence to form alpha helix. Uh, helix and the uh, D term uh, is calculated from U bread and is uh, uh, a uh, disorder uh, factor. Uh, we obtain uh, this kind of uh, result uh, uh, using NYOM. Uh, uh, the lines indicate uh, this is the receiving number in a protein, in a sequence, and this is the, the, the amidation half time uh, in log scale expressed in days. And the lines uh, are the prediction for all the position in a curry sequence uh, in the hypothetical case uh, that they were occupied by asparagine residues, the orange dot are uh, extant asparagine residues. The purple line is the half time calculated uh, experimental uh, half time calculated from peptide and structured peptide. And the uh, green line are the half time calculated by Neom. As we can see, most of the asparagine deciduous uh, would not uh, deamidate or are uh, highly protected by uh, structure factor, uh, but uh, a few of them uh, are prone to the amidate. Um, so uh, using NYOM, we can calculate the deamidation profile uh, um, of the entire spike protein, uh, and we can locate this uh, deamidation site from asparagine uh, to a region or domain. Um, we only consider non-glycosylated uh, asparagine. Um, as functional sites uh, are expected to be conserved, uh, we, we include uh, some uh, other uh, spike protein from related uh, cervicoviruses, including, including the SARS uh, spike protein. Uh, so what we observed, um, according to the deamidation uh, half time obtained by Neom, this is the position for the spike protein, and this is the deamidation half time, uh, we can differentiate two types of residues. Um, uh, one uh, with a deamidation half time uh, uh, that go from month to years, uh, they are mediating in a slow regimen, uh, and they probably lack any functional role uh, because of the these residues would not deamidate during the virus life cycle. But a uh, few of aparagine residues deamidate uh, in the order of hour to days. Um, those residues that deamidate faster uh, in the fast regime uh, are called uh, onwards uh, deamidation uh, hotspot. Um, there are five deamidation hotspots in the spike protein from, uh, from SARS-CoV-2 uh, at the position uh, 481, 501, 544, 866, uh, and nice L7, uh, and we observe that they are not uh, homogeneously distributed over the entire uh, spike uh, sequence, uh, and indeed they are 
concentrated at the receptor binding motif, which is a specific region in the spike protein that make contact with the ACE2 uh, receptor, and moreover are uh, concentrated uh, in a specific region, the receptor binding motif, uh, the other is the receptor binding domain. This is the receptor binding motif, sorry, uh, which is a specific region within the receptor binding motif that uh, establishes direct contact with the ACE uh, receptor. And uh, this profile is also observed when we analyze the entire the proteome of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. Uh, uh, we observed that the vast majority of uh, proteins of uh, asparagine residues uh, would not uh, deamidate uh, during the virus life cycle. We mean non-enzymatic uh, deamidation. Um, and that uh, deamidation hotspot are uh, clustered or, or, or that uh, structural protein uh, are enriched in the amidation hotspot. For example, this is the spike protein and this is the uh, nuclear protein. So uh, uh, based on the premise that functional sites are conserved, we then analyze the conservation pattern or degree of the uh, the amidation hotspot. We observed that four out five of the amidation hotspot are highly over 80% or strictly conserved. This is the, the, the amidation half time expressed in day in log scale, and this is the conservation uh, degree. Um, and we analyze uh, most of the Sarveco virus uh, sequence. Uh, in particular, we focus on the uh, the amidation hotspot 481, because uh, this site uh, is located at the receptor binding ridge. This region, this, this structure is the receptor binding ridge at the receptor binding domain of the uh, spike protein. Uh, it's located in a lateral wall and it uh, does not make direct contact uh, with the ACE receptor. However, uh, many of the bat infecting cervicoviruses are the voice of the, of the receptor binding ridge uh, because they lack, uh, well, they lack uh, the entire sequence, but also they lack uh, the cysteine that uh, form a disulfide uh, bridge. But in any way, they keep a uh, deamidation hotspot at equivalent position when we superimpose both structure. So this suggests topological that indicate that topological constraint uh, drive the conservation of the amidation site, and this strongly suggests that functional uh, a functional role. Um, as a relevant aspect uh, regarding conservation of uh, the amidation of pot is that uh, uh, is how these sites are conserved or mutated in emerging uh, variant box. Uh, as we can see, the uh, less conserved the amidation of pot uh, asparagine 501. Uh, was uh, uh, mutated at the very beginning of the pandemic history, the introduction of a uh, tyrosine residue at this position increased the ACE2 binding. Um, and uh, well, it was uh, mutated. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another side, the, uh, the asparagine uh, 856 was mutated in the, was observed mutated in the Omicron subvariant BA1, but uh, was soon restored uh, in the subvariant BA2. Um, so we want, we, we would like uh, to, uh, to obtain uh, experimental deamidation data from uh, this uh, deamidation hotspot. But high quality deamidation data, specifically quantitative deamidation half time data, uh, are scarce because there are two reasons that works against uh, the determination or of accurate uh, data. First of all, uh, um, 
uh, is the accelerated generation of the amidated species during sample processing. That's uh, because uh, uh, the reduction of uh, disulfide, the alkylation of cysteine, and the treatment with protease before uh, a mass spec experiment uh, produce uh, unstructured peptide that show uh, the fastest deamidation rate. Uh, in addition, uh, peptide containing uh, the, the, the product of the deamidation is the aspartic or isospartic containing species, and uh, uh, the deamidation of asparagine containing peptide split into two different uh, species. Uh, uh, this peptide differ in only one dalton. Uh, we can see here a multitude of experiment. Uh, in which uh, a, a small peptide deamidate over time. Uh, and uh, this, the, the mass difference is uh, only a uh, one Dalton, and it overlaps with the natural isotopic distribution of the peptide. So uh, we have to set up an improved methodology for uh, overcome this limitation. Uh, so what we did was uh, to incubate proteins, uh, the RBD or the spike protein uh, that was recombinantly produced at a uh, neutral pH over up uh, to, to certain day. Uh, we reduce circulated the cysteine and we add the protease. Um, we treat the samples at a slightly acidic pH. Then we resolve the peptide mixture uh, using reverse phase HPLC, and we identify the peptide using uh, mass spec and orbitral. Uh, I show you here one of those experiments. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, the intensity of the asparagine containing peptide decrease uh, with incubation time uh, in the orders of days uh, because of the, this is the, the time uh, when uh, the amidation occur. Um, and uh, with this uh, data, we can uh, uh, compute the amidation half time. Um, then uh, two uh, species uh, increase. Uh, one is the aspartic containing uh, peptide, and the other is the isospartic containing uh, peptide, which at uh, that moment we did not dis uh, discriminate or identify using extra mass spectrometry experiment, for example, high energy fragmentation. But anyway, we can differentiate it uh, by means of the retention time. Um, with this information, uh, which indeed we did uh, several replicates, uh, we can build a decay graph to obtain the deamidation half time. Um, we first evaluated the uh, the 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 amidation half time for the host pot present uh, at the RBD protein. Uh, it can be clearly seen that uh, the amidation is negligible at four degrees expected, uh, but uh, the amidation is. Uh, uh, accelerate at 37 degrees. Uh, we observed that uh, uh, asparagine 481 uh, amidate with a half time of uh, 17 days, and the uh, asparagine 400, uh, 544 amidate with a half time of eight days. Uh, in our hand, asparagine uh, 501. Uh, is uh, refractory to the amidation. This is surprise because it was surprising for us because uh, this amidation is it is asparagine is supposed to deamidate faster. And uh, other author uh, in other works uh, demonstrate that this uh, asparagine deamidate. However, I'm going to talk uh, of uh, this case later. 
for example, uh, we then uh, perform the same uh, experiment for the spike, the, the full length spike protein, and uh, we observed that the, the amidation half time for the asparagine 481 was comparable. However, uh, the data for the asparagine 501 uh, are quite different. Uh, one uh, difference is that uh, uh, we have to add uh, uh, one millimolar of TCEP to the spike protein uh, in order uh, to keep the stability of this large protein. And uh, of course, this, uh, although this is a low concentration of reductant, uh, it uh, can uh, affect the integrity of uh, the sulfide and also the structure affecting, of course, the, the amidation half time. Uh, I would like to talk about some um, factor than, that affect the amidation uh, rate. First of all, uh, when we work with the receptor binding uh, domain protein, uh, we include uh, the analysis of the aparagine uh, 544, but uh, this asparagine uh, is located at the SD1 uh, uh, subdomain that in our uh, protein was incomplete. So this data uh, has to be taken carefully, analyzed carefully. Um, on the other hand, uh, this uh, asparagine um, uh, well, the, the second step of the uh, demidation reaction include uh, uh, solvent hydrolysis for which the succinimide has to be exposed. Uh, in the case of aparagine 544, the accessibility depends, this is the accessibility, the relative uh, surface area, exposed area, uh, depend on the position of the RBD domain. Um, the RBD domain can be in the uh, up conformation uh, where the, uh, this uh, asparagine is accessible to the solvent or in the down form uh, uh, and where this asparagine remain hidden from, from, from the solvent. Um, so with all this data, we generate and integrate uh, integral kin kinetic model uh, for the virus uh, that illustrate how the uh, multimeric nature of the S protein that is trimeric and uh, the virus affect the accumulation of the amidated species. This model was constructed using uh, or taking account only the experimental value for uh, only two sides, the asparagine 481 and the asparagine 501. Uh, and to be honest, the only that uh, uh, the amidate is the asparagine 481. Uh, but the model show us that uh, the deamidation, at least with this data, uh, would not be the main molecular mechanisms that reduce virus infectivity because uh, uh, the full deamidation uh, time for uh, the whole uh, virus is uh, over 1,000 days and uh, the virus infectivity uh, decrease by the soil incubation at 37 degrees is uh, more or less uh, from two days uh, to one week maximum. However, partially deamidated species uh, accumulate uh, hours after the, the, the spike protein is synthesized and uh, uh, after one day up to four uh, deamidated protomer, protomers, uh, mainly at, at the asparagine 481 accumulate. Uh, uh, then we, uh, we, we, we evaluate how the amidation uh, affect the affinity for the RBD, uh, the affinity of the RBD uh, for the ACE2 protein. Um, so to this end, we use octet uh, and an uh, 
an aged uh, RBD sample that contain a mixture of uh, asparagin, isospartic and aspartic acid uh, in uh, the, at the, um, the amidation hotspot. Uh, we observed that uh, the deamidation or the aging of the sample has a modest impact on the ACE recognition. Uh, of course, we are uh, measuring the effect mainly of the asparagin 481. Um, finally, uh, it was reported that uh, uh, the glutamic 481 uh, a mutation for this in um, that uh, um, is observed in many uh, antibodies cape in mutant uh, affect the recognition of uh, neutralizing uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and uh, because of uh, this deamidation hotspot is close to this uh, Side, we uh, evaluate uh, the effect of a mutant that again partially emulate uh, the amidation on the recognition of these three uh, monoclonal antibodies. I am going to show you only two, but the uh, general result is that the that uh, this mutation uh, does not affect uh, the recognition of the uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so uh, we publish our result and uh, we present biochemical and bioinformatic evidence that the amidation hotspot are a conserved trait uh, in the receptor binding motif of Sarveco viruses, not only the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, that the amidation hotspot, uh, some the amidation hotspot are strictly conserved. Uh, we, we were able to measure the deamidation half time for uh, many of the deamidation hotspot in the spike protein. Uh, we show that conservation is the driving uh, conservation uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, is driven by topological constraint, at least for the asparagine 481. And this strongly suggests some functional role. Uh, we don't know actually what it is, but it, it suggests it. Uh, and um, that the deamidation of asparagine 481 do not affect the, the binding of the receptor or the neutralizing antibodies. Uh, anyway, we are exploring the uh, promising uh, possibility that uh, the deamidation of asparagine 481 uh, introduced at the novo integrin binding site. And uh, we are exploring also the possibility uh, of an allosteric regulation of uh, the, the amidation rate by the redox en environment. So we would like to thank all the collaborators and uh, especially people at the Hamburg unit uh, and Maria Garcia Lai. Thank a lot. Thank you, Leonardo. For, for the nice talk and all the results that you are showing. We have some questions uh, from Eva Hyde. So it says, the amidation can be seen by 13C NMR and 13CO spectra. The peaks for the aspartic are very different from those from asparagine. Can you make the part of the protein? Yes, uh, but uh, the data about uh, RMA of uh, receptor binding motif, just uh, this domain, uh, are very scarce. And uh, of course, for large protein, RMA is uh, quite difficult to, to, to do. So uh, yes, we can uh, evaluate uh, the amidation using uh, NMR. But uh, this is limited for a small protein or domain. Not is it's not the case of uh, the spike protein. And it says uh, pH will will increase the amidation. Doesn't this affect your result? Yes, of course. The increase in pH, you can try uh, any pH you want, but uh, anyway, uh, we try to to restrict the pH uh, to physiological pH. 
like uh, uh, neutral or slightly slightly basic pH. Okay, so there were no more questions from the audience. I will just um, have a question. So are, are you looking into uh, studying the amidation in other antigens from other pathogens as well? Yes, in the dengue protein are all, and also in the, the hemagglutinin from influenza. And uh, in addition, we are uh, analyzing the effect of the amidation in the um, uh, whole conformation of the spike protein using cryo-IM, because many of the highly conserved sites uh, impact in the positioning of the RBD domain with respect with the uh, spike protein. And is the resolution you're getting good enough to see this? Yes, we are getting a structure of, uh, of uh, the amidated uh, spike protein. Uh, what, what resolution are we talking? No, we are just refining this with the NIH collaborators, uh, but we have a nice picture about the and very interesting result because it uh, uh, affects the position of the RBD, some of the very conserved site. So we are analyzing uh, the effect of this uh, demidation, uh, but of course using mutant. Not, not the naturally deamidated sample. Oh, okay, good. Okay, thanks a lot, Leonardo. And thanks to all the audience that was with us. And I say goodbye. Thanks for joining. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. To, to all our speakers. It was great talks. Bye bye. Bye.